We're recording. Ooh, boom, hello. Boom, boom. Rumble. From Thundercloud. Watch the way the garbage leaving rainbows up and rains. Everyone knows Mum calls me Jones. Let's have some games, linguistic games. <laughs> hello, Gladys. Hello, Jones. Sky, Sol, <laughs> Ashley. And one and all in all the world, as you're listening, men, women, boys, and girls. Well, what have I got for you tonight? To begin with, we'll acknowledge the traditional custodians from which we of the land on which we broadcast, the Banbai and Kamilaroi people, and acknowledge the continuing connection to the land of the elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge sovereignty's never been ceded. And what have I got for you tonight? Well, the internet went down this week, and. Um, and also I've been studying a bit of Nancy Keesing up there and um, reading a few of the Nancy Keesing, Douglas Stewart uh, anthologies of old bush ballads and stuff like that. So I'll be bringing you some of those, but... So James, do you think the internet might have gone down because of that hobby balloon that they shot down over America? Definitely. That UFO? It was it, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> the internet came oh, down. The, the, it was the <laughs> aliens <laughs> interfering <laughs> with us, yes. Definitely. I'm often interfered with by aliens. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, Nancy Keesing. Um, but I'll be doing that <clears throat> after the one I wrote in pen because the internet was down. What do you do? And now, this, this is prefaced with an idea that some people don't have Facebook, so they might not know what Facebook jail is. Facebook jail is when you post something that Facebook deems inappropriate. So they censor you, and as you know, Facebook's not a free speech platform. Um, you could go and join Donald Trump's um, Twitter truth or whatever it's called, if you want a free speech. So the other day, this is called No Name, it's just the internet went right down. The other day the internet was down when everyone awoke. People lifted their heads, put their hands down, looked each other in the eyes, respectfully, listened, connected on a personal level, and spoke. Smartphones were left to charge on a shelf. One family went bushwalking, one boating, swimming, running, hunting, fishing, skiing, and one old lady took up bungee jumping. And many people had an improvement in their mental health. The day the internet was broken, when we all awoke, with a big surprise, there were early morning walks and jogs without Spotify, and people stopped and paused to watch instead of photographing and posting the sunset and sunrise. There was no TikTok, Insta, YouTube, Netflix, no banking, no email. Johnny learnt to ride a bike. Mary painted a landscape scene. Albert went for a six hour hike. Jolene started a volleyball team. And no one cared that they were in Facebook jail. Very good. Did you write that? Yeah. And show the camera your calligraphy. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, what the yeah. <laughs> It was written really quickly. But there you go. <laughs> mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, I, I have got good polygraphy in this book, though. They look like wild waves looking for a rock. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's definitely left-handed calligraphy. Oh, you're a left-hander like me? Yeah. With three left-handed sons as well. With three left-handed sons? Yeah, I think we're um, descendants <laughs> of aliens or something. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Modern man. That's it, eh? That's yeah, it's we've got our... Creative side switched on. Mm. The, the levels gone ridiculously 
Yeah, over the last 20 or 30 years, like left-handedness has gone from 10 to 30 percent of the population. Yeah. And a lot of it's to do with the fact that we're using both hands on our devices, both thumbs, instead of being spanked into using the right hand. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Great, I'm going to do this one of uh, Nancy Keesing that I did the other week because I really liked it and I like making my bread. Bread. Oh, except the last line kind of doesn't apply to me like the child swelling in the womb. Just let you know that. Bread. I make man's ancient food that at blood's temperature gathers its own life begin to seed and stir. I plunge my fists within, resilient dough for bread, the living leave and stuff, fragrant and moist to knead. Takes shape from my hand, its warmth of growing yeast, springs from palm pressed in and curls back to resist. My Atavistic hands find an old skill to throw and press and curve and turn and shape the living dough. I set the bread to rise and hear the smallest sound beneath the muslin cloth that covers it around. It's the sound of life from that dough that warmed the hand and took the blood's heat to grow that I shape the loaves. They stand. Again, to rise before they're baking into food, bread that's a symbol of plain, good life in God. And generations of women who ground the flour for bread and set it by their ovens and curved strong hands to knead, how intimately they knew whence man's true symbols come, the seed the yeast, the bread, the child's swelling womb. So that's yeah, Nancy Keesing. And, um, and I'm going to do another one that I did last night, which I really liked. And um, before there was one machine, and I, I really resonated with this because it um, comes in with, sort of runs along that one I did just before the day the internet was broken. Before there was one machine, the silence of the world, the unexpected variousness of sound, before the drill, the engine, the clock, or the first turning wheel, before even the monotonous water wheel, silence, or sound with nothing to measure it out, nothing to time it by, before speech or song, earlier than rhythm, clapped out by hand, or started on drum, the silence of the world. For even the surf, or water on stone falling by single drop and drop, alter, increase, diminish and falter, the silence of that world, its only regular sounds, being soft, breathing, and the animal heart. you into some place like that. All right, um, who's gonna, who's ready to come up first? Anybody? Because I, I just throw in another I, one. I can if you like. Ashley, sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's Welcome. all right. Ashley, I'm Yes, well. I'll probably bring it in front the chair. Yeah. Well, Well, three rulers. What have we here? Hypothesis, 
implication and parameter. And I was just throwing the I Ching. And I got heaven, thunder, and the mountain. Interesting. No water, no fire. The mountain, which we're standing on top of. Uh, thunder and um, heaven. And there is something heavenly about Gaira. I spent most of the day um, in my little white bubble car in front of uh, Mother of Ducks Lagoon. And I watched the light watching me across six or seven hours into the sun, sunset. Um, you don't really have a sunset here. Things sort of come up at you more clearly, but they also drift away, and the light drifts with them. Very mysterious place, Skyra. So, I will start by making a sociological comment that, uh, you know, country folk have their wits about them too. Look at this uh, headline from the Inverell newspaper of last week. Drop dead Fred. And I bought it thinking there'd been a tragedy over at Inverell Way. Mm -hmm. But it was just going fishing to get me to spend $2.20 and buy the newspaper. So you see, rural folk can be up on all the tricks. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, an the, 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 comment, the comment of um, drop dead Fred uh, lost in... Coke and Dam was, uh, the switch is on for a missing mannequin named, search, sorry, is on for a missing mannequin named Drop Dead Fred after it was lost during a training exercise with the Inverell SES at Coke and Dam. What does SES stand for? State Emergency Service. State Emergency Service. So if you're watching this out in Outer Mongolia, who knows, we're talking about the emergency service that would go out to get your horsemen if there was some sort of strange uh, avalanche. Okay, so, uh, the horsemen of Mongolia. That's a subject. I, I sat down just then and tried to write an ode to Fred. Drop dead Fred, missing in the dam, the tribe of lost their l totem. S-E-S, S-O-S, S-O-S to the S-E-S. They do for Fred, for fire and drought and flood, he lies him down. The full bosomed clerk resurrects him, resuscitates him. Our not quite lost horseman comes back to give him a kick to see the stir of life. Fred, dead Fred, the practice bogan, keeps ourselves alive. Observations Fred imparts to find out in the Copeton depths our waterlogged trooper. Yes, he's a tragic man, Fred, isn't he? Perhaps, possibly the Menikin, uh is, is an equal analogous figure of the bush with um, the man from Snowy River, except this time the Snowy River came over him and uh, settled him down under fathoms of H2O. Well, here's one of my sound, sound poems. Was that going down all right? Or? Oh, yes. Did I utter into speech without proper transmission? No, oh, okay. That'll work so, out. so well, maybe I'll we'll need it for this. This is my um, thought about the present conjuncture of the world situation, which goes something like this. E e e e dum dum mum 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 free doom bum boom bum 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 da bum bum free choice rejoice me voice om om om. And uh, yes, that just about sums it up. Sorry? There's a bit of that that was talking to those Mongolians. Oh, I would have loved to have been a horseman in Mongolia. That would have suited me just fine. And my grandfather, my, my mum's dad. Okay, here's one I did the other day. 
year or so ago now, and uh, it's close to my heart. But I realise that every sound in it is somewhat uh, hominem-like in English. It can be interpreted in various ways. So, ko, or, more, not really. <laughs> Well, I do enjoy that because I remember how Vince laughed with his, with his dog uh, when I did it in the little room in there. Um, Butto had a laugh too with Vince and I laughed heartily. Well, the world situation, what can we say? Um, three words, pray for, pray for peace and not for too many pieces of it. Now, <clears throat> all week I thought about mental health and that if you keep yourself mentally on track and healthy, you're doing it not just for yourself but for everybody. Is that not true? Now, um, I will read something by Bruce Dawes. I was really thrilled the other day, somebody came up to me in the street and said, oh, I listened to your poem about Bruce Dorr and uh, enjoyed it very much. And then we had a long hour discussion about Bruce Dorr and the political spectrum of Australia in the 1950s and 60s. So you can imagine if you know me how I loved that. Homecoming. And then I'll read something uh, about the Aussie bush and horsemen. Shadows in the Mist. Uh, how long ago did he perform here? Fortnight back? Mm. Um, John Watkins. Mm. Wonderful fellow. Homecoming by Bruce Dorr. Um, some student has written at the bottom of the page. I love annotation and critical comment. Vietnam War, all emotion is understated. The people are dehumanised. Telegrams bring grief like leaves in a spider's web. Just bodies to the people who pack them up. Hope, or people to the families. No, people to the families. The young people express themselves very well sometimes, don't they? People to the families. Families for the people, homecoming. All day, day after day, they're bringing them home they're picking them up, those they can find, and bringing them home. They're bringing them in, piled on the hulls of grants, in trucks, in convoys. They're zipping them up in green plastic bags. They're tagging them now in Saigon. In the mortuary coolness, they're giving them names. They're rolling them out of the deep freeze lockers. On the tarmac at Tan Sun Nut, noble jets are whining like hounds. They are bringing them home. Curly hairs, kinky hairs, crew cuts, balding non-coms. They're high now, high and higher over the land, the steaming charm in. Their shadows are tracing the blue curve of the Pacific. With sorrowful quick fingers heading south, heading east, home, home, home. And the coasts swing upward. The old ridiculous curvatures of earth, the knuckled hills, the mangrove swamps, the desert emptiness. In their sterile housing, they tilt towards these like skiers, taxiing in on the long runways. The howl of their homecoming rises, surrounding them like their last moments. The mash, the splendor, the, and then fading at length as they move on to small towns where dogs in frozen sunset breaks muzzles in mute salute. On and on to cities in whose wide web of suburbs telegrams tremble like leaves from a wintering tree. And the spider grief swings in his bitter geometry. They're bringing them home, now late, too late, too early. And I think that my dear grandmother had to go up the steps at West End many moons ago and take the telegram saying that uh, one of her brothers was kaput. 
the women of that generation who were born around the early 1900s didn't have that easy a time in the 20th century. I think almost wherever they were born. Now, Men of the Carnarvons. Uh, I'll read a little of some people like the city and then something about his reflections on uh, time and tide, although he was moving over the stones and dust of the Aussie bush. But all phenomenon is time and tide from a certain angle, ain't it? So, some people like the city. Some people like the city. They love the city lights, admire city buildings, and crave the city sights. They put up with the city noise and rush along city pace. They're used to breathing smog as they run the old rat race. But where they see the city lights, then they don't see the stars. They don't see the Milky Way or view Jupiter and Mars. They don't see rising sun. They don't see rising moon glowing orange, large and bright, or a country scene at midnight, lit by flooding lunar light. Oh, forgive me for getting one word wrong there, Mr. Watkins. And I will finish with um, his uh, window on the past. Um, I'd often, when I taught out Walgett Way and Ridgeway, um, talk to my fellow teachers and normal citizens in this town going through this image, as all Australians who think must. A window to the past. While wandering in the bushland beneath the basalt range, I came to a location which made me feel quite strange. It was a sort of friendly place, not a place that you would fear. My mood, it seems, was also shared by the birds that I could hear. I was shaded by tall brigalows, and as I looked around, I decided that I stumbled on a Murray camping ground. There was shade and shelter bare ground to make a fire, good spot for nomad hunters when they began to tire. And there beside the sandalwood, beneath the Wilga shade, lay a piece of weathered granite, ground down to a blade. Then as I picked the stone axe up and held it in my palm, the ancient history in it held a special kind of charm. These things make you wonder, and I guess we'll never know about the lean black man who used it a thousand years ago. Was he with family group, or was he hunting on his own? Was he a lonely outcast, cursed by the dreaded bone? There's a bit of nomad in me. So I feel this strange rapport with the man who held this implement centuries before. I stopped a while to catch my breath, take in the atmosphere, to think about the fact that I was not the first man here. Then reluctantly I left the shade and travelled on again across a little stony creek, then onto a black soil plain. And before I settled into stride along the homeward track, I paused and gave into the urge to have one last look back. One last look back at a bit of bush cloaked in mystery of happenings that have long ago passed into history. I'm not the first to ponder this and I won't be the last. And for a moment there I held a jar, a window on the past. Thanks for that, Mr. Watkins. Um, much appreciated. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah, the whole book's great. Mm. Very heartfelt. What is there but to feed your heart? Mm. As Yates would say, what is there but to feed your heart? So that was, that was John Morgan's book, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to have a look at it. Yeah. So uh, oh. I really well look forward to getting into it. Mm. Oh, you've got me. Yeah. No, I don't actually. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> Make that mm. You may not be able to find one for a few days. Okay, um, now behind me we've got Nancy Keesing on that side and on the far on that side, or just left, right, doesn't matter which way you're facing, it's that side, that side, 
You've got Douglas Stewart, um, Nancy Casing. Um, what was she? She was born in 1923, but when she was 51, 52 or something, she went and got a job with the Bulletin as, um, and uh, she was writing for the Bulletin, but she also worked a lot with Douglas Stewart to compile volumes of Australian poetry, bush ballads, and stuff that if it wasn't for those two, it would have been lost in lost in just history and stuff like that. Um, so this one that I'm reading out of tonight, Australian Bush Ballads, edited by Douglas Stewart and Nancy Keesing, and it's got a lot of ones by Anonymous in it because um, they just didn't know who they were and they were just um, songs that general people used to sing. This one, we know who it's by. It's by a, a fella called, well, could be a woman, I oh, know, a fella, Francis Humphreys Brown. And it's called <coughs> Scotty's Wild Stuff Stew. Mm. The cause of all the trouble was McKay, the jackaroo, who had ordered what facetiously christened Wild Stuff Stew. He'd shot a brace of pigeons and brought them home unplucked. It was not the first occasion and no wonder Scotty bucked. And aside he threw the pigeons and addressed the jackaroo, yeah, pluck those blinded pigeons or you'll get no blinded stew. But the jackaroo objected, and he objected strongly too. He said, I'm not a slushy, you can keep your blinded stew. But Scotty didn't argue much, he winked across at Blue, and turning to the slush he said, I'll give him wild stuff stew. The next day it was Sunday, and not having much to do, we all assisted Scotty in the making of the stew. We raked along the wool sheds, in the pens and round about. It was marvellous all the wild things us Rousies fossicked out. There was Ginger found a lizard, which they reckoned was a Jew. It was rather rough to handle, but it softened in the stew. Then Snowy, found some hairy things inside a mustra's tent and Splinter found a lady frog and in the lady went. From McGregor who'd been foxing we'd obtained a skin or two and it should have gone to bootlace but it went into the stew. <laughs> then someone found a Kelly that the boundary rider shot. It was more or less fermented Still, it went inside the pot and Scotty found some insects with an overpowering scent and the slushy trapped a mother mouse and in poor mother went. There was some hesitation about a spider in the tin. We didn't like the small red spot, but Scotty dumped it in. There were a host of other things I can, can't recall the lot they were cast into eternity per medium of the pot. Those strange and weird concoctions that the abo sometimes brew would be as mild potations and compared with Scotty's stew and when the jackaroo arrived, a happy man was he to find Scotty after all had cooked a stew for tea. Well, he rolled his eyes and snuffed the fumes. Twas dinkum staff, he swore. He complimented Scotty and he passed his plate for more. And when we'd let him have his fill, we took him round to view the list of what had left the world to enter Scotty's stew. 
I grant you, there were wild things connected with that stew, but there was nothing wilder than McCabe the Jackaroo. He got the dries and then the shakes and we felt shaky too. We were thinking of the spider with the red spot in the stew. We rushed him to the homestead. They told him twas the flu, but us Rousies, we knew better. It was Scotty's wild stuff stew. But Scotty isn't cooking now, for Scotty's long dead. They say he turned it in through booze at Thurl and Guna Shed. And away across the border, there's a certain jackaroo who for years has never tasted what he christened wild stuff stew. <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah, so um, yeah, just on, on that note, I have read it as it's written here and um, just note on the language of the time refer as racism, uh, referring to the Indigenous people of the land here as abos, and um, so we just it's pretty anti-Jewish comment too, really, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there is, isn't there? That's um, definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wild stuff stew. All right. And um, there's another one I really wanted to do, but I couldn't find it. Um, this is Paru River by Henry Lawson. It was a week from Christmas time as I, as near as I remember, and a half a year since in the rear, we'd left the Darling Timber. The track was hot and more than drear, the day dragged out forever, but now we knew that we were near our camp, the Paru River. With Blighted eyes and blistered feet with stomachs out of order, half mad with flies and dust and heat, we'd cross the Queensland border. I'd long to hear a stream go by and see the circles quiver. I long to lay me down and die that night on Paru River. The nose bags, <coughs> heavy on each chest, God bless one kindly squatter. <coughs> With grateful weight our hearts they pressed. We only wanted water. The sun was setting in a spray of colour like a liver. We'd fondly hoped to camp and stay that night by Paru River. A cloud was on my mate's broad brow and once I heard him mutter, What price the good old darling now? God bless the grand old gully. And then he stopped and slowly said, in tones that made me shiver, it cannot be well on ahead. I think we've crossed that river. But soon we saw a strip of ground beside the track we followed, no damper than the surface round, but just a little hollow. His brow assumed a thoughtful frown. His speech did he deliver. I wonder if we'd best go down or up that blessed river. But where, said I, eyes the blooming stream? And he replied, we're at it. I stood a while as in a dream. Great Scott, I cried, is that it? Why, that's some old bridal track. He chuckled. Well, I never. It's Plain you never been out back. This is the Paru River. Yeah. So yeah, if you uh, know about that channel country, um, it, a lot of those rivers and that only flow in flood season. Uh, I've been really looking for a poem that I'd love to do for you all again, which I haven't been able to relocate called The Last of the Kural Bulkas, which is about a uh, um, a tribe that um, was stuck on the high country, on an island during a flood in the Channel Country, and the only two people that survived were the father and son that swam off and like hung onto a tree as the snakes came down and killed everyone. Um, yeah, and I, I really would love to find that book which has got it in it, and I can't. And I don't, 
it's a rare in some way. It's sad for them to look over onto the island and watch mm. everyone die. Mm. Yeah. Okay, now, I saw... Are you ready? Not really. Yeah. What about Sky? There's, there's still a tremendous problem. A friend of mine lost her dog mm. on her small isolated farm in the Walgett flood, and her dog was a love of a life, and a snake took it, coming up onto the island of the property. So it's still a problem. Yep. Close to, so it's if that goes on, it could be heard. Yeah. yeah. Very sad to lose your dog because of the flood <laughs> and the snakes. Um, so you say, so you say, words that don't mean a thing. So you say, I don't mean a thing, anything. That's okay, because words don't mean anything in any way when the truth is really the actions we display. And the only one that's here in every way is me that I need to impress every day. Yes, you can go on your way, causing havoc, being any way you please. In your own little world, playing on others' insecurities. Those words don't harm, not me, nor bring a hollow inside I know who I am. I'm worth more than you think. My mind is a wondrous thing. I can rest my head down knowing I've done all that I can to be at my best and I'm happy with all that I am. Supple, supple, groan and grind and gra grapple, lick and suck and kiss all over, wanting to feel you inside. The flowing friction, the connection of soul, oh how blissful, oh blissful is you. <laughs> Interesting line. <laughs> the music of Isfal. Isfal, yeah. Wow. You have, what was that, that line about your mind? You have a beautiful mind. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Mind is the wondrous thing. Yes, it is. Mm. I was, like, I was really like into, I was like into that, you know, I could feel it like, because I closed my eyes and just got into it. Yeah. I get where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get it. Mm. <laughs> um, so, Douglas Stewart, Nancy Keesing, I, I've got the, the newer book. This one was called um, Australian Bush Ballads, but this one's called Old Bush Songs. Now, I, I've finally chosen out of this uh, a few little shorts, and, and the reason I chose some little shorts is because later on I've got a series of eight little poems called Pissing in the Wind, um, or Little Squirts, actually. Uh, and I, I guess I got a bit of inspiration from Nancy Keating and that showground uh, sketchbook that she's got, where she's got um, sort of a poem, a, a title, the showground sketchbook, and then she's got that series of six poems about it. So anyway, but that's me later. Now we got some little kind of ditties, uh, um, little funny things. As he lay one night by F. H. <clears throat> As he lay one night near a tall gum tree, his reason came and went. He writhed in agonies by his fire and he thought of his life ill spent. Then he calmly slept his last long sleep. 
Starvation was his debt. He thought he lied neath the sunny smiles of his mother, sad bereft. Next morning, an old swagger passing by the dell saw the remains, stifled a sigh, and muttered, Another by hell. Okay, well, that's not the funny one, that's the next page here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> there, here we go. The crows keep flying up by Anon. Oh, the crows keep flying up, boys, the crows keep flying up. The doggy seen and whimper, boys, thought he was a pup. The lost was found, we brought him round and took him from the place while the ants were swarming on the ground and the crows were saying grace. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, the crows keep flying up. Here's another one. Me and my dog by Anon. Me and my dog have tramped together in cold weather and hot. Me and my dog don't care whether we get any work or not. That's it from the bulletin on the 26th of August, 1899. Mm. Um, so yeah, article on the gum tree poet, i.e. a travelling bushman who cuts verses into the bark of trees. Mm. So there you go. Did you know about gum tree poets? No. That I didn't. Well, cutting verses into the bark of trees, that's fantastic. <laughs> they will just disappear though. All right. So then we've got here um, the bagman, the bagman's toasts. Um, there's a bit of a introduction and on. These oddments were collected by Nancy Keesing from Mr. W. B. Hughes of Carlton, New South Wales. Mr. Hughes was on the track between 1917 and 1922. On the track is like the wallaby track when you're out um, looking for work. Um, he explains they're not drinking toasts, but rather a sort of identification chant that is round campfires or meeting places, one bushman might embark on one and anyone who completed it proved himself to be one of a similar fraternity. Numbers one and two and three were heard on the Darling between Burke and Tilpa, perhaps in 1918. Uh, so number one, the Bagman's Toast. This refers to the station rations of the time to which a bagman were entitled, namely eight pound of flour, ten pound of meat, two pound of sugar, a quarter pound of tea, which was referred to briefly as Eight, ten, two and a quarter. Um, okay, so here we go. A little bit of sugar and a little bit of tea, a little bit of flour, you can hardly see. And without any meat between you and me, it's a bugger of life by Jesus. It's a bugger of a life by Jesus. Yeah, that's it, the bagman's toast. Um... Good as any beep on the track. I wonder what beep means. Um, yeah, bastard. We'll put, we'll put bastard. Um, any, any person on the track. Jack the Snorter, this is called. I can pick a lime through the scrub and pine and stick a pig or pork up, ride a hackle, boot a black, good as any something on the track, and they call me Jack the Snorter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, down the down fell the old nag is the next one. Down fell the old nag dead between the shafts. The old man said, "The old nag's dead. We'll pack it, pat it back to town." Oh dear, no! We all begin to crow. It's much far too far to roam. So we'll harness up the old woman, put her in shafts and make her pull the whole lot home. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that you, Gladys? Are we gonna, no, no. We're gonna, we're gonna harm, no, we're gonna harness you up. <laughs> and make you pull us all home. <laughs> um, the Shearer Man. This verse was supposed to have been spoken by an Afghan or Indian hawker collected by Mr. Hughes out from Blackall, Queensland. 
Shear a man like toast and butter, Wolseley comb and lister cutter, Rouse about like plenty joke, Plenty rain and engine broke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, are you ready for a song? What Woo! engine is he referring to? From the shears outside. Yeah. The shearing the engine. Could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, that's what I was suggesting. And the railway came out to there about that time, I think. It goes yeah, to Blackburn. Yeah, could have been lots of steam engine. Particularly steam if it's engine. after, eh? I mean, that railway. Yeah. So Any I'm engine will do if it's bummed. The railway from South Australia to Darwin. They did, yeah. Hello ladies and gentlemen, how do we do? Hope you've had a wonderful week. Yes. I'm gonna do some uh, first one I got tonight is a um, a friend of mine called Todd Moore wrote and I think I've actually got a little hole in the middle of it um, because I've just taken it off memory. I think there's a bit I can't quite remember, but it's uh, there it is, and 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 it's it's called Romance Criminal, Ooh. and uh, it's to do with like he le he left his missus and didn't go back. That's why. So yeah, here we go. I thought that out, Lord loneliness, and that that banished pain. And then in the ever after, there'd be rainbows with no re rain. But my tears keep falling down until it feels like I might drown. And I'm breaking all the romance rules again. And I'm howling to the moon because you left me way too soon. And I'm breaking all the romance rules again. I remember that was actually his wife left him and then asked him back and he wouldn't go. <laughs> so... That's one I thought I'd quite like. Um, this is just a little sort of affirmation for those of you who may need some uh, self-support. You know, I've done this one before, but... Um, I missed the boat and told the captain and the crew don't wait for me. So I set sail in a tin can and thought, I can take this ship out into the open sea. But the current and the wind and tides and pirates came with their broadsides all held me back from what I thought was my destiny. Well, I rode against the wind and tide and stayed afloat against those broadsides. All the while that I fought for life, my life was laid out before my eyes. As I survived, I grew wise then I realised, to my surprise, I had become the captain of my good ship on the sea of destiny. Oh, really? uh, yeah. um, this is just a little tiny anecdote I, I wrote down that I thought was very funny. Um, I was sitting near a couple in a coffee shop and they were breaking up. And he says... <laughs> Come on, baby. One last night. And she says, No way, get fucked. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> How's then? <laughs> For men. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was one of those nights, I don't know if anyone's had one of these sort of nights. It's called, um, I'm sorry but I had to go. I was driven to distraction by the subtle interaction of the light upon your face and the shadows interlacing, tracing you upon my mind, sending sparkles racing down my spine to crystallise between my thighs. I'm sorry. But I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
last one is just a little little anecdote. Uh, well, you know, when you uh, anyway. To be a drop of coffee. I have held you, I so tight, in my imagination every night. Picture perfect in every way, our bodies melded into one, in a seamless fantasy of sheer delight. But it wasn't quite the same when I saw you once again. Caress my eyes, your eyes like a thousand candle flames, your hand upon the coffee cup, so graceful with its touch. Your lips with every sip sent tingles down my spine, the spine. From the threads of hair upon your head to the red shoes that wrapped your toes, you put my imagination to shame, and in our momentary embrace, I lived a thousand lives again. <laughs> Hello, Vincent, welcome. Hi there. Yes. Oh well, well good uh, <coughs> everyone out there in Facebook land, like in the, in the description there, there'll be uh, a GoFundMe link. And if you do feel like donating to the Australian Park Free Hall of Fame, you're very welcome. And I'll tell you, I've got a huge announcement. I've actually decided on a date for a poetry festival here, and it's the 9th, 10th, and 11th of November. So 11, 11, and then um, on the 12th of November, the New England Writers' Centre, will, which is the Sunday, will have a, a poetry walkabout here as well. So it'll kind of be a four day thing. And it'll include a, a poetry competition and performers and workshops as well. So um, if, you, if you guys have got ideas or about stuff, um, people out there in, the, in YouTube who are watching this and Facebook as well, um, if you'd like to be part of that, I'm looking for quotes. Um, I'm also looking for sponsors, uh, grants, a whole bunch of stuff so we can make that really big and fantastic. Um, hopefully the plan is to get schools in, involved and have young you know, local school students come here as well and learn a bit of poetry, writing and performance, as well as um, to engage um, First Nations, multicultural, multicultural uh, group of people in town, and our uh, well, we already engage our seniors, don't we? All of us, um, <laughs> not you, right? Um, or me, yeah. Um, this one, look, I've been on a health kick this year. Uh, like, I've always been pretty healthy, but I actually doing more exercise because I, I got a bit like overweight and unhappy with myself and a lot of, you know, painful and stuff and I didn't like it. And so, yeah, this is what happened. A man I know rolled across the room and then rolled down the street, a bell tolled at the local church. And he rolled on despite the heat. He rolled to the edge of the land and then he rolled across the sand and then rolled into the ocean and stopped rolling when he left the land. A man I know swam in the sea when he could roll no more. He said, I'm sick of rolling, I don't want to roll on the floor. I want to hop and step and jump, I want to swing and s swim. So I've rolled here to begin to swim, I want to be fit and slim. A man I know transformed himself by deciding to become his best, set himself a daily challenge and each day a harder test. He changed his daily diet, goes to the gym as fit and trim. He's no longer roly-poly James. He's now known as Jim Slim. It's actually my dad used to call me Jim Slim sometimes, occasionally. He didn't call me. <laughs> no, no, well, no, not really ever. Like, yeah, I, when I got back from China, I was like 86 kilos, and then within 12 months, I went down to uh, 72, uh, 62. Yeah, yeah, but that was all through swimming and diet, basically cutting out carbs and having like particularly bread, um, beer, sugar. That kind of stuff, but when I was in China, drinking so much beer there, 
because it was really cheap and delicious to be in in China too, actually. Yeah. Like they, like um, up, up there, what's the place, Qingdao, and uh, where they make the really good lager. Uh, I think the Germans told, taught them how to make it and um, they make really great lager right through China because you've got to drink lager because they don't refrigerate it, they have like warm beer most of the time. Um, yeah. Right. Um, what else have I got for you? I've got shorts now. Um, these are little shorts that I, I kind of wrote for, um, for why? Just pissing in the wind, it's called. They're called little squirts, pissing in the wind. I might start with eight, the last one. The best thing that ever happened was a roof blowing off. Push me to growth and change as my old life was lost. Picked up bits in braced growth and change. Mm. Stopped pissing in the wind and completely rearranged. So there, nice. this one. Now this was the first one I wrote. So yeah, I did just start with eight, number one. Gotta stop pissing in the wind. There's things I don't need to shout in a busy street and in the wind. Gotta stop waving it about. <laughs> Two, thunderclouds piss down rain, blow and gush in on the wind. Destruction brings new growth and gain. Piss with, not against the wind. Mm. Uh, just, just on, on this, this, this was actually inspired by uh, an experience that I had back in around about 2001. We, Dad and I had a forestry nurse and we were doing a plant, planting a plantation. And so I went out, we were out on the, in this paddock and it was blowing a gale, right? And I needed to pee, but the farmer was coming, right, from downwind. So I couldn't, you know, flop it out. In a paddock, so I'm turning and I'm facing into the wind, pissing away, not looking. And I just get this whole, my shorts are just totally covered in pee. <laughs> like, seriously, it just all blew back on me. It was like, yeah, right, okay. It was a windy day, dried out quick, and it's only. <laughs> now I drink it, so it doesn't matter. Um, right, number three. The wind blows on everyone. There are times when you must piss. There's even solar winds on the sun. Just watch the direction that you piss. <laughs> Four, do not piss into the wind. It comes right back on you. Moderate the things you speak and try and control where you spew. <laughs> Five, watch your words like you'd piss discreetly. With moderation, you're not disgraced completely. <laughs> That's yeah. another little, a little short idea, thought, a short thought. And number six, your poo is smelly and a real stink. You ought to use the toilet, not the kitchen sink. Just across the street is a toilet door. No need to piss in the wind or on the floor. <laughs> Seven, open up your mouth, drink a glass of piss. <laughs> to stop your mouth twitter, oh, it'd be better than listening to this. I'd rather listen to the wind, naked in the snow, than to listen to the piss and wind that your mouth blows. <laughs> uh, uh, um, yeah, okay, so that's um, pretty much that. Um, I got a few more, but they're just sort of kind of bleh, meh, meh, yeah, that's it really. I'm, not, I'm done for the night, uh, actually. Oh, Armageddon. 
Mm, I'm a getting tired. I'm a getting out of here. Uh, I'm a getting ready for bed. Uh, set my alarm for 5 a.m. I'm a gonna rest my head. Then I'm a getting up early in the morning. The day after, I'm a getting. I'm a getting horny. <laughs> no one left, do they? <laughs> Just me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see which one's bigger. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's been lovely to have you here tonight. And um, thank you for the, joining us there in, um, in the internet world, when the internet's not down and when you're not in Facebook jail. It's been a long time. Have you been in Facebook jail at all ever? Never. Wow, you must be very complicit. <laughs> You don't do conspiracy theories. No. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Have a, have a lovely evening, and we'll see you next week for Wednesday Words.